All right, welcome everyone to Baton Hour. Today's Baton Hour, as I just said to those who joined us a couple minutes ago, is even more timely than we anticipated. And um, first, I would just like to welcome our host today, Libby Scully, who is one of our Baton students. And she is also the founder and president of our newest student organization at Baton, Pride. And we are thrilled that she showed the leadership and took the initiative to found the organization. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. And then most important, she's going to introduce our very special guest whose time is in incredibly high demand, Josh Block. We're thrilled that he's here to join us um, to talk about some very important and um, very, very time sensitive issues. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Libby. And just as a reminder, um, there will be ample time for questions at the conclusion of Josh's remarks, and we ask that you use the Q&A feature for any questions you might have. Thanks so much, and now I'll turn this over to Libby. Dean Rockwell, thank you so much for the introduction and beginning the event. Everyone, thank you for coming to Pride's inaugural event. PRIDE, which stands for Policy Plus Rights Drive Equity, is Baden's new LGBTQ policy group. I'm really excited for this event and so thankful for Joshua Block for coming today. Joshua is a senior staff attorney with ACLU's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and HIV projects. He is lead counsel in Grimm versus Gloucester County School Board, the first federal court of appeals decision recognizing that Title IX protects the rights of transgender students to use restrooms consistent with their gender identity. Joshua is a member of the legal team that litigated Augerfell versus Hodges and United States versus Windsor before the Supreme Court. His litigation docket covers employment discrimination, educational opportunity for LGBT students, attempts to use religion to discriminate, access to healthcare for transgender people, military service, and censorship and free speech. In 2012, he was named one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40 by the LGBT Bar Association. Josh is a graduate of Amherst College and of Yale Law School. He clerked for Judge Robert D. Sack on the U.S. Court of Appeals for Second Circuit. Josh is one of five ACLU attorneys featured in the award-winning documentary, The Fight, currently available in theaters and streaming on demand. For more details, visit fightthefilm.com. Josh will be speaking for about 20 minutes, then we'll break into a Q&A session. Feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of Zoom during his talk. Once again, thank you so much for talking to us, Josh, and you have the floor. Thanks, Libby and Jill. It's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be here virtually. Um, I, you know, UV is beautiful in the fall, so it's, it's too bad I can't be there in person. Um, so, hi, my name is Josh, uh, and as you heard, I'm an attorney at the LGBT Project. And today, I, you know, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty brief, but I want to just give an overview right now of where things currently stand um, in, you know, the most current issues in the courts concerning the rights of LGBT folks, and especially LGBT students. And then, you know, the most fun part of these uh, events is always talking to, to people and hearing folks' questions. So. Um, the big news, well, it's funny, it's hard to say the one piece of big news, but one piece of big news this year uh, was the Supreme Court's decisions in uh, Bostock um, and in uh, EOC versus Harris Funeral Home. Uh, and so those cases uh, were cases in which the Supreme Court held uh, by a six to three vote that uh, Title VII uh, which is the federal statute that prohibits sex discrimination in employment, um, covers discrimination against people who are LGBT. And uh, the reason why it does is fairly simple. Um, the standard for coverage under Title VII is anytime uh, an employee's sex is taken into account, is an element of the decision in any way, um, then that triggers liability under the statute. So sex doesn't have to be the only cause, doesn't have to um, be the sole cause, it just has to be one factor in the decision. And so when you, uh, when you focus on the statute that way, um, if someone is gay, by definition, that means um, that they are attracted to people of the same sex as them. You can't, you know, you can't even describe someone as being gay without referencing their sex. Um, and the same is true for people who are trans. Um, 
regardless of how you define sex, I think that one of the mistakes the other side made in these cases is saying that um, uh, proponents of, of equal rights for LGBT folks are trying to redefine sex to mean gender identity. And wh whatever the debate is over what sex means, you could take the other side's definition of sex as, you know, whatever, you know, your, your chromosomes or they actually don't have a consistent definition of sex, but let's even say sex for their purposes is defined by chromosomes. Being transgender um, means having a, a gender identity that is different from the sex assigned to you at birth. So even if you think that sex assigned at birth were the definition of sex under Title VII, if you're discriminating against someone because they're trans, you're by definition taking into account what their sex assigned at birth is. Um, and so I, I think this case, it's been, you know, the culmination of, you know, decades of work. And it is, it's not a case that people necessarily uh, were expecting uh, to come out the way it did. No, we weren't expecting it not to come out the way it did, but it was certainly, um, you know, no one thought it was in the bag. And I think it's a watershed case because um, the court gives two reasons for why Title VII provides these protections, even though you know, they don't disagree that no one at the time the statute was passed specifically had in mind that it would be protecting LGBT folks. And the two elements are, um, it provides a protection for individuals, not for groups. So it's no defense to say we treat men the same as women as a class that like we discriminate against gay men and against gay women, therefore it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. They say what matters is, you know, whether someone's individually being treated differently um, than they would be if their sex were different. Um, and the second is that, uh, again, once again, sex doesn't have to be the sole cause or the primary cause. So, um, and you know, the very first Title VII case involved a fact pattern like that. That was a case where a company had a policy saying, if you were uh, a mother who had children under five, they wouldn't hire you. Uh, but if you were a father who had children under five, they would. And you know, the company said, "Look, we hi most of our employees are women. We don't discriminate against women. You know, we, you know, we hire many more women than men. It's just that we are discriminating against people who are mothers with kids under five. Uh, and but that's not the same as discriminating against women." And the court said. No, by definition, you're treating a woman who has kids under five differently from a man who has kids under five. And really, there's a straight line from that first Title VII case to where we are today. Uh, but the holding in title in Bostock and Harris, even though it didn't specifically involve other statutes besides Title VII, um, its core logic is going to apply to every other federal non-discrimination statute out there that prohibits discrimination based on sex because it has exactly those same standards. So that includes Title IX, which is a law prohibiting um, discrimination in educational institutions receiving federal funding. It includes the Fair Housing Act. It includes um, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which prohibits discrimination in healthcare. Um, it doesn't include public accommodations because there's actually no federal statute um, that protects against discrimination in public accommodations on the basis of sex. So as far as federal law is concerned, there's nothing prohibiting a store owner to say, we only serve men, we only serve women, uh, or, or, or we don't serve uh, gay people. Uh, but every, you know, almost every state has uh, state level protections. And, you know, Virginia, thankfully, not only prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, but also now is explicitly prohibits discrimination on the basis of uh, sexual orientation or transgender status. Um, so, so I think one of the open questions after Bostock is, well, where else does this reasoning apply to? And I think that's actually a very, very easy question. Um, you know, to I think every other court that has like applied, looked at other statutes and asked, does Bostock apply here, um, has agreed that it applies to all, you know, every statute under consideration. I think the, the more open question here is, well, how does this rule apply in context in which sex is allowed to be taken into account. So um, I'll just list some of those here and then we can discuss them in more depth. So one is, well, how does this rule apply in the context of sex separated restrooms and facilities uh, where you know, that's, not a, that, that's a context in which um, Title VII and Title IX are currently understood to allow um, uh, people uh, of different sex to be treated differently. 
Um, how does it apply to other Title IX activities, such as uh, separate classrooms for, for uh, boys and girls, which is allowed under certain circumstances, or athletic competitions? Um, how does it apply uh, to contexts of um, denial of health care? Um, access to health care for people who are transgender, um, including not just, uh, there, there are plenty of cases where people being turned away from, you know, non-transition related care just because they're transgender. But the additional question is, um, almost every court to, the, to consider the question has held that uh, denying health care coverage uh, because the coverage is for gender transition is itself discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, and then there are questions about, well, what about uh, the uh, rights of folks who uh, want to discriminate? Uh, and so that comes in a lot of flavors. And here in Virginia, there's a case where a public school French teacher um, wanted to refer to a trans student um, by the wrong pronouns. And of course, when you're speaking in French or, or many other languages other than English, you so much of how you conjugate every sentence like hinges on uh, the gender you're using uh, to describe the, the noun that you're talking about. So um, like even if you thought that there was a, a way in other circumstances to just avoid the use of pronouns, like French and, and many other languages are just very gendered throughout. And the irony here is that, you know, that the teacher has no problem referring to an inanimate object like a pencil with with the gender but um, objected to referring to a student uh, by the student's uh, gender identity and the school said well that's our policy you know we don't discriminate against our students and they said if you're not going to comply with that then you can't teach here and so he um, was terminated and he's brought a suit saying that violates his rights um, but then, you know, similar attempts to claim a right to misgender people have been asserted, you know, um, besides by teachers, but also by public employees. And even, I, shockingly enough, um, we are in one of our cases right now, the opposing counsel, you know, has asserted a, a right to want to misgender our clients. And when the court said, no, you know, we value civility in the courtroom and you can make your legal arguments without um, sort of breaching that civility. You know, they filed a motion to have the judge recused for, for bias. So that's gonna be another a path um, of, of religious liberty arguments. Um, I think in our short time here, I'll, I'll focus on um, the case of Gavin Grimm since that's most close to home in, in Virginia. And you know, this case has been going on for a very, very, very long time at this point. Um, the underlying events happened six years ago, and we're only now getting a final ruling from the Court of Appeals. So as folks probably know, uh, Gavin, um, at the time these events happened, he was a 15-year-old uh, boy who's transgender, uh, who, you know, over the summer, uh, when he transitioned before 10th grade, uh, he and his mom had met with the school, provided them a treatment documentation letter from um, his, his treating uh, therapist, confirming that he was a boy, he was under treatment uh, for gender dysphoria as part of that medically necessary treatment. Um, he would be acting in accordance with his gender identity in all respects. Um, he had been referred for hormone therapy and was uh, starting consultations for that. He had already legally changed his name uh, to Gavin at that point. And uh, when he met with the school, the school was you know, very uh, accommodating and welcoming and said that they'd be um, also you know, treating him in accordance with his gender identity. And um, it was agreed initially that um, uh, for the first few weeks he would use uh, the restroom in the nurse's office. Um, but after a couple of weeks of doing that, you know, I think he, uh, discovered several things. One is that the nurse's office is really far away from his classes and, you know, he'd have to, there's not enough time between classes to use the bathroom over there. And if he had to go to the bathroom in the middle of class, he'd lose a lot of time. Um, at one point, even a teacher uh, sort of called him out in class, like, why are you gone so long? <laughs> and sort of, and other, it sort of made him stand out as an object of ridicule, even by the faculty. And then of course, 
uh, you know, being sort of told he has to walk across the school to use a separate restroom that he's the only one who's required to use, you know, was pretty stigmatizing. And every time you have to do that, you're sort of reminded of, oh, I'm not being treated equally like everyone else. There's something different about me. There's something less acceptable about me. Um, he met with the, the school principal and the school principal after consulting with the superintendent and with uh, council and with um, the Virginia School Boards Association and the Virginia Department of Education uh, agreed that he should be allowed to use the same restroom as other boys. Um, and he did that for seven weeks. And now, so during this time period, um, the, the school board has had years and years and years and years and years to talk about what sort of privacy violations might have happened during that time period for other students. And it's come up with zero. Um, there, there's one incident of a student um, at the very beginning uh, telling the principal that he was uncomfortable with the idea. Um, the single student. Um, but there's no other incident of anyone actually, any, including this single student, of anyone uh, describing any encounter with Gavin with the bathroom. Um, there's, <laughs> Gavin recalls only one incident where he was in the restroom, another student was there at the sink, said, told Gavin, nice shoes, uh, oh no, nice socks. And Gavin said, thanks, and, and that was it. So the, the record is totally devoid of any actual disruption in the restroom. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, parents uh, complained to the school board. The school board then, without consulting any uh, you know, medical expert, um, uh, decided to pass this policy that they called their biological gender policy, which is sort of hilarious. Um, uh, and uh, this policy said that, um, it says, whereas the school recognizes that certain students have gender identity issues, uh, restrooms will be provided to students based on their biological gender and um, students with gender identity issues will be provided an alternative facility. Uh, so, you know, on its face, the policy is like being passed only for the purpose of responding to trans students. Um, and it has no effect on any other student. Every other student in the school continued doing what they were doing uh, the day after the policy is what they were doing the day before. You know, no one else's restroom has changed. The only effect was to take Gavin out of the boys' room and force him into these separate restrooms. Uh, you know, two of them were made out of um, converted custodian clo closets. Uh, and then a third uh, single user restroom was actually right next to the nurse's office. So. I mean, even if you were inclined to use it, it didn't actually provide any more convenience than the nurse's office did. Um, no restrooms near Gavin's classrooms, uh, no single user restroom at the football stadium. Uh, so when Gavin had to use the bathroom, a friend had to drive him, you know, uh, down around the corner to a construction store or his mom had to pick him up early. Um, he, he, they're, they're I, I sort of don't want to go into too much detail about the record, about uh, all the day-to-day -day effects uh, this had on him, uh, you know, including, you know, from trying to avoid using the restroom as much as possible, um, having constant urinary tract infections. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, um, you know, he had even, uh, you know, had an incident where um, he like was having suicidal thoughts and had to be hospitalized briefly. Of course, the hospital put him on the boys' ward and treated him just like any other boy, which is exactly um, the medically appropriate thing to do here. And then even after got, Gavin got uh, top surgery and got a uh, court order declaring that his uh, sex under Virginia law was male and got an amended birth certificate, the school still refused to allow him to use the boy's restroom. So not only is he being treated from every other boy, he's also being treated differently from every other person who has an official Virginia birth certificate. That policy is even more extreme than uh, um, North Carolina's uh, HB2 policy, uh, where that was a law that said trans people have to use restrooms based on their birth certificates, you know, and that was, um, you know, challenged successfully in court and it caused a whole boycott of the state. So the school board's policy is even stricter, you know, than that, that, that they don't care what other, you know, so-called objective evidence there is confirming someone um, uh, is actually who they say they are. Uh, they want to have their own definition of 
of sex, which um, of course, when you ask any follow-up question, it doesn't make any sense because, you know, well, so what happens if there's a trans girl um, on, on who has been taking hormones, maybe had um, uh, puberty blockers. So, you know, she never went through a typically male puberty, you know, has gone through a typically female puberty. Um, all right, under the school's policy, she would have to be in the boys locker room. Um, and you ask, well, you're very concerned about boys being uncomfortable with the trans boy in the in the boys' room. What about boys who are uncomfortable with the tra with a trans girl being in the boys' room, which is what your policy would require? And the school said, oh, well, those boys can just use one of the private alternative facilities. And so then the question is, well, if that's good enough privacy protections for boys who are uncomfortable with trans girls, why isn't it also a good enough privacy protection for boys who are uncomfortable with trans boys? No answer there. That's, um, so I, I think um, the courts uh, thankfully uh, held that this violated both Title IX, the statute prohibiting sex discrimination and the Equal Protection Clause. And, you know, and the reasoning is pretty straightforward. You know, we have separate restrooms um, you know, for, for men and women. Um, and I think they have been uh, thought to be consistent with equal protection under the understanding that these are facilities that are treating people differently, but still not treating them fundamentally unequally um, and with no social stigma attached to it, no difference in access. Um, there's actually never been a challenge um, uh, that I'm aware of to the existence of sex separated restrooms. Uh, so, you know, Ginsburg, um, the late Justice Ginsburg in, in the UVA, uh, not the UVA, sorry, the VMI decision where she held that VMI couldn't exclude women, she talks about how, you know, sex is different from race. It's not viewed as an inherently stigmatizing and unequal classification. Um, and it's possible to have um, an all boys school and an all girls school and have them actually be equal. Uh, but when you look at the details of what Virginia had done, which was have VMI as one school and then some new made up school, you know, for, for women that was supposed to be an equal equivalent, they weren't equal in any respect. And, and that's actually how she's been always litigating her cases from the beginning that um, back in the 70s, you know, people wanted to bring these challenges saying separation based on sex is inherently unequal, just like race. And she said, no, 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 no. What you have to do is just show them in every individual case why it's actually not equal. Um, and when you actually dig into it, those facts become plain. And uh, she actually compares the VMI situation to um, the situation of Texas Law School in Sweat versus Painter, which is one of the lead up, to lead up cases to Brown, where it showed how having separate but equal law schools uh, uh, based on race was not actually equal. Um, so the jurisprudence in this area is, we're gonna look really closely to see if it's really equal or not. Um, and so if you apply that reasoning to the context of restrooms here, um, they're, they're sort of tolerated under this understanding that is treating people differently based on sex, but not in an unequal way. But these separate restrooms for Gavin were both separate and very unequal. They were unequal as a practical matter, and they were unequal as a matter of like dignity and, and stigmatization. Um, and, you know, it's just, it was very striking to me on the Fourth Circuit panel uh, where Judge Wynn uh, sort of directly compared it to the situation of, of separate schools, uh, you know, in where he was growing up, um, where he said, you know, technically anyone was allowed to go to the school for, for black kids. There were, uh, just like anyone is technically allowed to use these separate restrooms, not just Gavin, but everyone knew <laughs> um, that they were the worst ones to use and that uh, they carried a stigma using it. And that was just for the disfavored students. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's just been very interesting how um, the, the parallels that have been drawn have been um, sort of consistently drawn uh, by judges who have actual personal experience in the area. Um, and the defenders of these policies sort of express outrage that anyone, anyone would ever compare them to um, so-called separate but equal on the basis of race. And um, 
time and again, people with actual experience under those regimes say, no, this is totally a similar dynamic, um, that it's inherently stigmatizing to be separated and uh, branded as a threat to other people's privacy. Um, where Gavin's case stands right now is we won in the district court, we won in the court of appeals, um, and the judge that dissented from the panel said um, that he hopes the Supreme Court, you know, takes up the decision. Um, you might remember that, you know, the Supreme Court did take up the case four years ago where we initially won under a narrower theory, uh, which was that um, the court was going to defer to the Obama administration's interpretation of the statute. Uh, and the court had granted cert um, to review the case. And the very first thing that Jeff Sessions did as soon as he was confirmed, the very first thing was to withdraw the guidance that the Court of Appeals had deferred to, which sent it all the way back down to the co lower courts for the courts to then apply the law without giving any deference to anyone. And so now we're back up here again. And um, so that's where we are. There's another case in the 11th Circuit with very similar fact patterns. And um, obviously, one of the things the Supreme Court looks for when it decides to take a case is whether there's a disagreement among the circuits. There's no disagreement at all on this issue. You have three circuits, the 4th, 7th, and 11th, that have all come out the same way. You have another two circuits, the 3rd and the 9th, that have rejected claims from cisgender students saying it violated their privacy to be in restrooms with trans students. So um, if the 11th Circuit doesn't uh, get reversed, I don't know if folks know, there's something called going on bonk, which is where normally only three judges on a court of appeals issue a ruling, but for big cases, all the judges on the court, so like, which is usually about 15, can all hear the case together. So unless all 15 judges decide to reverse what the three judges did, we'll still have unanimity in the lower courts, which helps defeat a cert petition. But um, obviously, uh, with, with, the, with Justice Ginsburg's passing and um, these open questions about who's going to be in her seat, I, I think it's hard to make predictions about what's next. I, I think maybe now is a good time to open it up uh, to questions. And I'm looking forward to whatever you got. Yeah, that's a great transition because one attendee asked, do you think the vacancy on the Supreme Court will present, will present an opportunity to overturn precedents on LGBTQ protections? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's important to, um, there are two different types of precedent. All right? There's precedent for cases interpreting statutes and there are precedent for take cases interpreting the constitution. And when it comes to cases interpreting statutes, the court is much, 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 much more hesitant to reverse um, old precedent because the idea is we're just interpreting a statute. If Congress disagrees, they can fix it. Um, so I think Bostock is on solid ground for now. It was a 6-3 decision. Uh, so uh, with um, Gorsuch and, and Roberts joining the four center left justices. Uh, so with Ginsburg uh, not on the court, even if she's replaced uh, by someone who is inclined to overturn Bostock, it would still be a 5-4 majority. And I think that um, other justices like Justice Kavanaugh, I think, would be reluctant to overturn statutory precedent. Um, constitutional precedent, however, is easier to overturn, you know, counterintuitively under the idea that, well, the court's the only one that can fix it if the court got it wrong. So, um, you know, I, I think people sort of thought, oh, Obergefell and marriage equality are, are safe. And I think there's a stark reminder today that that wasn't true. That's not true. Um, one of the first cases after Obergefell was this case in Kentucky where a clerk named Kim Davis, so this is a government official, the government official in charge for issuing marriage licenses was refusing to issue licenses to same-sex couples uh, because of her own religious objections. So this isn't some private church, this isn't some, uh, even like a private employer, this is the government, someone saying, I'm gonna wield the power of the government to discriminate because that's what my religious beliefs say. And you know, her claims were rejected by a very conservative district court judge. You know, her claims were rejected by a very conservative Sixth Circuit panel. Um, and it, because litigation takes as long as it takes, 
um, those, uh, her case was up for review at the Supreme Court where she was asking the Supreme Court to take the case. And just this morning, the Supreme Court declined to do so, but Justice Thomas and Justice Alito really um, uh, they issued a little opinion that was just this diatribe against Obergefell um, and how it's had ruinous consequences for marriage, for uh, religious liberty, and the court is the only one that can fix those consequences now. Um, and, you know, I, I think that you know, there are areas where there's actual tension between, you know, religious liberty and recognition of equality. Um, but I, I would, I would, would have thought that even, even someone um, who has a maximalist view of religious rights to discriminate uh, wouldn't think that the government, a government official, should have the ability to do that um, with government, governmental power. Because it's not even like she would let someone else from, you know, it would be a slightly harder question if she said, I'm not going to issue those licenses personally, but I'm going to have a deputy issue it. You know, we would think that's also unconstitutional, but that that's a different fact pattern. This is she wouldn't let anyone from her office issue it, uh, and but there's no no recognition of that in Alito and Thomas's decision at all. Uh, and so I think if, if they are as you know adamant um, in this most extreme context, that is you know a very worrying sign, both for their desire to overturn o Obergefell itself and for their, their desire to sort of effectively nullify the decision by carving out so many exceptions um, for people who want to discriminate um, against married same-sex couples that it ends up um, being degraded into a second uh, class status marriage in any event. Because the asserted religious rights of people who object to same-sex marriage, it, you know, it's even recognizing someone as being a same-sex couple that's married for purposes of processing employment benefits, um, for purposes of taking a reservation at a restaurant, for purposes of buying a, letting someone buy an anniversary card um, for, for their spouse or for their children. Um, the, the claimed right to refuse to recognize the relationships of same-sex couples is so expansive that um, if it is, if it's taken seriously, you know, by the court, I think of all, there's so many myriad ways that the fact that someone is married, like affects all their interactions. Um, and they're claiming someone has a right to just um, treat the same sex couples differently in all those contexts. Um, so it's, it's, it's a scary proposition. Um, this connects pretty well to a question that I had. Um, do you, it's about strategy and of the ACLU. So do you appeal to the Supreme Court if you know you're not going to have a favorable court? Well, so, you know, it's funny. I, I think in now, now, now I'm no longer on this under 40s list, but I, uh, but I think for a while, um, all of, all of strategy for um, LGBT rights, I think, was affected by Bowers versus Hardwick, which is a decision in 1986 where the Supreme Court held uh, that the, it's totally constitutional to um, make people criminals for having consensual sex in their own homes with someone of the same sex. And I think that, you know, for decades after that, the game plan for LGBT rights was always, let's go to the states, let's expand protections under state law, state constitutions, you know, stay away from the federal courts. And um, even landmark equality decisions like Romer versus Evans, that was a state court decision that the, that the LGBT folks brought. And then the Supreme Court granted review from the state court. So the idea of same-sex couples going to federal courts was a pretty new 21st century thing. You know, when I was a 1L in law school, you know, we learned Bowers versus Hardwick as, you know, the black letter law, which it was. Um, and it was overturned uh, in 2003, like before my 1L year was over. So, um, so I think that the idea of the federal courts being a friendly forum for LGBT folks was a very small window of time. And even then, it was sort of fair weather friends. This is a 5-4 majority where everything hinged on Justice Kennedy 
And you never really knew um, if you could uh, count uh, where he would come down. So I think that, you know, eventually, after, you know, when it came to challenging DOMA, when it came to challenging um, marriage laws, after a long time of, of trying to stay in state courts, there finally was a brief window where LGBT folks were affirmatively going to the federal courts. Uh, but I think that um, that sort of crack of a window um, is, is definitely not open right now. Um, but I think it's also, it's, it's um, there's this idea sometimes that, oh, well, if, if LGBT folks stop filing federal cases, then it'll never go to the Supreme Court. Um, and that's not true because the Kim Davises of the world are filing, filing their own cases. The French teachers that want to misgender trans kids are filing their own cases. Um, and those are, the Supreme Court is very eager to take those cases. So it, it's not like, and if you think of right now, we have a case at the court um, uh, called uh, Fulton uh, versus Philadelphia. And that's a case where um, Philadelphia, uh, like many other jurisdictions uh, that has a foster care program, uh, works with uh, third party contractors uh, to help uh, recruit potential foster parents for, the, for that program. So th this is not private adoption. Uh, this is children who are wards of the state, uh, you know, in state custody, the state is responsible for their care. Um, and they contract with third parties to recruit foster families. And um, the Catholic Social Services in Philadelphia um, wanted to continue contracting with the city, continue receiving state city funds to go perform this governmental function, um, but didn't want to follow the state criteria in doing it, wanted to turn away um, uh, same-sex couples. And, and this isn't about recognition of marriage because you don't even have to be married to be a foster uh, parent. <laughs> um, but they said, oh, we can't, we can't recruit folks because that would be our endorsement of marriage. And in every other context, when someone says, well, I, don't, I want this government funding, but I don't want a, the strings attached to it. So such as um, doctors um, who, if they receive Title IX funding, aren't allowed to tell their patients about uh, abortion as an option, they have challenged those rules in court. And the Supreme Court said, well, if you don't want to go have those conditions, then don't take the money. No one's coercing you to do anything. Um, that's been the standard answer. Uh, but, but here, um, there's a big risk the Supreme Court's gonna give a different answer. It's gonna say, oh no, you're allowed to the, to the money and you're allowed to you know, refuse these, uh, to comply with the conditions. Um, and if you think about how much of how many governmental services are contracted out, um, the, the notion that a government contractor could be able to um, exercise their own religious veto on how to perform a governmental function is just really staggering. Uh, but it's not a case brought by us. We intervened as defendants. This was bought, brought by um, the Catholic Social Services. Um, and so I, I think that you know, unfortunately, uh, some of these cases are going to be continuing. And you know, it's, it's obviously a strategy to keep those issues away from the Supreme Court. Um, it's clear that with the possible exception, of, with the exception of the Fifth Circuit and possible exception of the Eighth, the Supreme Court's probably the least friendly forum to LGBT people at this point. Um, you know, you can keep, you can try to keep a lot away, uh, but it, it's sort of a, uh, a risk that overhangs, you know, all cases that are out there. So that's, that's been life for, for a really long time. And all these people that are, who are still on the under 40 list, um, you know, are sort of, you know, seeing, seeing what it used to be. Our next question is, do you think it will become necessary to pass a law or a constitutional amendment to guarantee LGBTQ equality or will the status quo hold? Well, so I think, so there's two, two separate questions. With respect to a law, um, you know, we are in a wonderful place after Bostock and, and having so many protections confirmed um, that were 
that were recognized by like half the circuits in the country, but in other places, you know, were, were not recognized. Um, but we still, there's still a big need to pass the Equality Act, uh, which is a, a law that would provide comprehensive and explicit protections um, uh, for discrimination against LGBT folks. Uh, and the Equality Act does several things. Um, I mean, one is it provides public accommodation protection, protections. Another is it um, would explicitly say that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act doesn't apply to it which is a, a statute that um, provides heightened rights uh, for, for people to challenge uh, generally applicable laws as violating their religious beliefs. So it's an open question now whether that law applies, a provides a defense to Title VII. Um, it wouldn't provide a defense to uh, the Equality Act. Um, but, but on the other hand, you know, if the Supreme Court wants to carve out these rights to discriminate, um, they can just carve that into whatever statute they want. And, and this is another thing about state courts and state law, you know, your state Supreme Court could say there's a right for you, um, an equal protection right under the state constitution, but the Supreme Court can say that state court rule is itself a violation of the federal constitution. So um, when you have these sort of maximalist claims that anti-discrimination protections inherently violate the rights of people who want to discriminate, um, that's sort of a threat, regardless of what branch you use. In terms of constitutional amendments, it's a, you know, we still don't have the Equal Rights Amendment passed, uh, which, you know, would have explicitly said that um, it's unconstitutional to discriminate on the basis of sex. You know, I, I, I think that um, there are a lot of ways the Constitution uh, needs, needs um, amending and, uh, the Electoral College being, being one of them too. So I, I think if there were a whole slate of constitutional amendments, I think that would be one I, I would want to add to it. Um, I think the hurdles right now to passing any sort of uh, amendment are, are pretty steep enough that it's um, more of a aspiration than a plan. Our next question is, how does the freedom to associate with hate groups play into this? Like, uh, for example, Masterpiece Cake Shop. Yeah, so, well, again, the, the freedom of association as always, you know, until, until, it became, until, until, um, until you had cases involving gay people, the freedom of association, uh, you know, provided two different sources of protection. One was the right to intimate association, choosing like your spouse, your close family members. Um, you know, th that was one type of protection. Uh, and the second was expressive association, which is like an expressive group should be able to speak its expressive message. So NAACP, uh, you know, it could keep its membership lists secret from a Southern, you know, Jim Crow state that wanted uh, NAACP to expose its membership list so they could then be targeted for harassment. Um, but also, you know, you, it's sort of the speech of that association gets protected just like a private person's speech would. Um, that sort of expressive association had never been applied to commercial businesses that had been struck down or rejected out of hand for decades. Uh, over a century. And actually, those claims used to be styled as 13th Amendment claims, not, not um, First Amendment claims. There's this idea that, well, if you're forcing me to serve someone, then you're actually compelling my labor. Uh, and that's, that's making me a, a slave. Um, you know, it's this, uh, you know, both sidesism of, you know, well, forcing me to serve uh, someone of a different race, that's just as bad as me forcing that person to work for me. Um, so that's, that, that's the language of that argument back then. Uh, and, and it's always been recognized that no, when you're engaging in commercial conduct, you know, that's a commercial transaction. That's not an expressive transaction. That's exchange of goods and services. Uh, and that is just what public accommodation laws sort of exist for. It give everyone access to the same, uh, open markets, capitalism, uh, what the country's all about. Uh, except, uh, and then you had in the 80s, a series of cases where you had sort of rotary clubs and, and other, you know, you know, quasi private organizations, but were really just like business networking opportunities that wanted to not allow women 
uh, and the courts there, at least the courts there said, well, this isn't a, an, a, a this isn't a business, so we're not we're going to give you some expressive association rights, but you know that's overcome by the government's compelling interest in preventing discrimination. Um, so, and then you got to Boy Scouts versus Dale, um, another case, you know, that went was in state court, but the, the Supreme Court then then took it, where they said that we're going to treat the Boy Scouts, which um, you know didn't uh, as an expressive association that can, ref can sort of refuse to have an assistant volunteer scoutmaster who's gay, because um, that's just like having a leadership position in a private expressive association and there are all these reasons why under existing doctrine like the boy scouts didn't behave at all like a like a traditional expressive association would but the court with justice kennedy and justice o'connor in the majority said the boy ha boy scouts had a first amendment right to not um have an assistant case a gay <laughs> an assistant case scoutmaster a gay assistant scoutmaster um now transferring that into the commercial context would be a huge leap, right? Because again, this was a volunteer position in a voluntary expressive association. When you hire someone in exchange for a salary or when you sell goods and services, that's a commercial association, it's a commercial transaction. Um, and that's supposed to be subject to um, plenty of regulation. So just under standard, uh, First Amendment law. A uh, shopkeeper does not have a First Amendment right to decide who the shopkeeper does business with. Uh, in Masterpiece, uh, the, the Supreme Court said that it thought that the law in Colorado had been applied by the Civil Rights Commission in a disrespectful way where they said things that the Supreme Court thought were rude um, and therefore it should, we're going to say that normally the rep, the therefore in every other case would be therefore we're going to remand for the case to be go up through the lower courts again without that taint of the, um, of the objectionable statements from the commissioners. But instead they say, therefore, the, we're going to dismiss um, the anti-discrimination charge against the baker. Um, but we're not saying anything about how the statute would be applied in the future. Um, this is sort of a one-time only thing. And so now it, it, there's a lot of, um, with Kennedy not on the court uh, anymore, I think this stuff is very up in the air about well, what does that mean going forward? There are plenty of other cases. There's a cert petition in Arlene's Flowers, which has been sitting with the court for over a year, raising the same issue. and. You know, the irony is that uh, they, you know, it's funny when they litigate photography cases, they say this is, we're only saying this right applies to real expressive things like photography, not stuff like cake and flowers. <laughs> and then the cake, and then they bring the cake case and they say this only applies to real expressive things like cakes, not stuff like flowers. And then they bring the flowers case. And that's again, because everything you do can have an expressive component to it. Um, if you're going to give it that sort of broad protection, which is why commercial transactions are not treated as, um, as, as having the same First Amendment rights as um, non-commercial uh, activities. So I, 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 I've totally forgotten the question now, but I think hopefully I answered it. Okay. You did. Um, and then the next question is, the issue of transgender athletes in high schools seems to be another divisive issue. Can you talk a bit more about that line of cases? Yeah, sure. So there's um, well, the vast majority of high schools, uh, athletic associations in the country allow trans people to compete um, uh, on teams consistent with their gender identity. So they allow boys who are trans to be on the boys team, allow girls who are trans to be on the girls team. And the vast majority of um, athletic associations don't require um, that those students have any particular medical treatment in order to do so. They just require that someone be recognized consistently in their daily life and school records as um, the, the gender that they are. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. In high school, athletics serve a different purpose than uh, college and Olympic athletics. Um, it's about um, all the other benefits that come uh, along with being in a team 
and, uh, and having athletic competition and setting goals. And, you know, schools usually have a wide uh, discretion in sort of setting their own, you know, educational programs and activities. And um, the thought was also that we don't want to require any particular medical intervention or treatment when people are still um, young. And uh, we don't want people to be, feel like they need to have any particular treatment in order to comply with um, our athletic rules, that people should be older um, to, before they're put in that position. Now, when you look at the college and Olympic level, they also let trans people participate in sports events consistent with their uh, gender identity, but they have rules on if you are a woman who's transgender, you need to have a certain amount of um, uh, gender affirming hormone therapy to lower your circulating levels of testosterone to be in the same level um, that cisgender women have. And there's a long, ugly history of sex verica verification in sports uh, where, you know, they tried all sorts of different ways in the Olympics to try to say who's male and who's female, which, you know, involved, you know, a um, examination of people's genitals and involved DNA tests. Um, and none of those things actually ended up doing what they were supposed to do. So um, there's famous um, athlete uh, who had a uh, complete androgen insensitivity uh, syndrome, which is where you have XY chromosomes, but your body does not, it does not respond to testosterone. So your um, external, your, your phenotype is all consistently uh, what a typical female would be. Um, and so there actually no, there's no muscular or anything at, uh, athletic advantage. And a lot of people don't even know that they have XY chromosomes until uh, often until they uh, try to have kids, but in this case, until they get an intrusive test. Um, and basically, the Olympics like learned from that experience that, you know, let's focus on, on, on hormones as the issue instead of trying to uh, do the sex testing. Also, because just consistently, the people that get targeted for the sex testing are, are were black women. Um, uh, that just over and over again. Uh, they, oh, they, they're, they're too mannish. They, they must not really be uh, a real woman. And so uh, the, the rules for trans athletes were sort of developed to sort of morph on to that, where once again, we're going to treat trans people the same way we treat sex testing in any other context. We're going to focus on circulating levels of, of testosterone. Um, what you have um, going on right now is there's a concerted effort uh, because uh, by uh, groups, including Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a group that um, is, defines itself as a Catholic legal ministry that um, uh, bring, you know, they, they challenge, they bring pro-life pro lawsuits, they challenge lawsuits, challenge laws protecting same-sex couples. Um, and and, and also now uh, bring lawsuits uh, for people who want to discriminate against trans people. And up until a year ago, they didn't, have a, they didn't seem very concerned with uh, women's athletics, but all of a sudden they have a whole women's athletics program, which is uh, to, um, where they represent cis women who, wanna, who say that they are unfairly disadvantaged by the participation of trans women um, in their athletic events. And they've been shopping around a law um, to all sorts of states, asking the state to ban partici participation of trans people. And what's interesting is because this is based on a religious belief about sex, that God created the two sexes, male and female, and any, any attempt to change the sex that God gave you is a revolt, is, um, a revolt against God. You know, they're not bringing it based on hormones, right? They're just, they, they wanna, and so they have these policies that they wanna push where, if a, if a trans student, even if the student has had puberty blockers and gender affirming therapy before puberty, they still wanna ban them from, from participation. So whatever one's thoughts about hormones and fairness, um, the laws that they're trying to get passed um, mean that a trans girl who has always been recognized as a girl since you know she was four or five and uh, never went through puberty, uh, the uh, typically male puberty looks 
indistinguishable from, from any other girl with respect to all the physiological traits that, um, that, that are thought to give someone an advantage, um, that she too would be barred uh, from participating on sports teams. And so one state passed their law, the ADF law last year, Idaho. A lot of other states were close to doing it, uh, but then they had to adjourn because of COVID. Uh, but Idaho was very determined to push through the law at the last minute, uh, and they passed the law. We challenged it on behalf of a, 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 a trans woman who competes in, high, in college athletics and on behalf of a cisgender high school uh, female athlete who um, said, I don't want to be subject to these invasive tests that, that boys don't have to be subjected to. Um, and we got a preliminary injunction saying that the law was unconstitutional, but focusing primarily on how it's like so overbroad for the claimed reason, the claimed justification for it, which was alleged physical advantages, um, because it applies regardless of if you've had testosterone lowering hormones, and even applies even if you've had um, uh, puberty blockers and, and gender affirming hormones, you know, at puberty. On a separate front, um, Connecticut is one of the uh, states that allows trans uh, people to participate without any medical intervention. And um, ADF brought a lawsuit challenging um, the, the legality of Connecticut's policy saying it violated Title IX by discriminating against cisgender girls. And again, whatever someone thinks about whether or not um, what the best policy is, this isn't about whether uh, trans people, you know, have a right to participate on the same sports team. This is about whether Title IX prohibits a state from allowing trans people to participate if the state wants to do it. Does, does Title IX mean that the Connecticut High School Athletic League can't have the same, first of all, I would say that they can't have the same rule as the NCAA or the Olympics, but also that they can't have their own rule, which is that if you're recognized in school records as, um, as a girl, then you can't be like, a girl up until 3.30, and then all of a sudden we're not gonna treat you as a girl anymore. Um, and also we don't even know uh, all the time whether someone at our school is trans or not. Uh, so this policy has existed since 2013. Um, and during that whole entire time, they've identified a total of two athletes um, uh, who are transgender uh, girls who were very good at, at track and they competed uh, in the same years. And so there was a year where in, when, you, when you sign up for track, you can only compete in either two or three events per championship meet, like of all the events. So in the events that they competed in, they uh, were first and second uh, statewide. You know, if you look nationally, there are plenty of cisgender girls that outperform them. So it's not like they're outside the range of what, uh, cisgender girls are, are, are capable of competing. And if you look at, um, well, what was the experience of cisgender girls like on the team and in Connecticut, um, plenty of other events where uh, other cisgender girls, including the plaintiffs in this case, where the plaintiff in this case is like the number three like long jump person nationally. So it's not the idea that there's this idea of we're being deprived of athletic opportunity and pushed off the podium when in reality it's about whether there's enough room on the podium for trans girls too. Um, and that's actually the case where they say they have a right to refer to the clients, our clients as males. And the judge said, you know, look, if you want to say biological males even, you can do that. But referring to these, these, these girls as males is just deliberately provocative and inappropriate here. And they asked him to recuse himself, he declined, and they're asking the Second Circuit to um, recuse him. But so that, that, that's the, the situation right now with, with, with athletics. Um, and uh, what, I, what I love is that there's this, there's this picture that's often in, in some publications about this is what people want to do when letting trans people compete with you know, cis people, and it shows a wrestling match. Of this, of this boy having this girl in a headlock, you know, and the idea being, you know, giving the impression that this, this boy is competing on the girl's team against, uh, you know, girl wrestlers, when in reality, this is a transgender boy who wants to be competing on the boy's team, 
And he's only competing on the girls team because of laws like Idaho that say he has to compete on the team with the sex assigned at birth. So this like iconic image that they show of, of um, unfair physical disparities is precisely because of this law, these laws they wanna pass that don't recognize people for the gender that they are and instead um, want to uh, like sort them or, or, or into uh, different teams based on their sex assigned at birth. I think that wraps up. I think that is just about, we were a little, even a minute over. We could probably talk to you for another hour, Josh. It's so fascinating. Our Dean um, commented in the chat, that this was absolutely fabulous and so impressive and informative. So um, we're glad he got to join us and you're just so thrilled that you took time out of your extremely busy workload to join us today and are so thankful for your work as well. Uh, thanks, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And we'll be watching for all the um, really a big to be continued and we'll just all um, be glad that there's people like you who are working to protect the rights of those who need it the most. Well, come, come join me um, and everyone make sure you're registered to vote and that you have a plan to vote because um, none of this means anything um, if, if people aren't voting. Thank you so much and keep, keep your head up. I know it must be Days like this must be tough. And so we, we really appreciate all you're doing. Thanks. Take care and thanks everyone. We'll see you next week for Baton Hour as well. And thank you Libby for your, your work. And we're really so excited that we'll help you with have more discussions like this. Um, thanks to your new organization and your leadership. <laughs>